Today we will be discussing working with independent contractors and then going into more detail regarding the differences between employees and independent contractors. My name is Lauren Wallen and I am the HR advisor here with CoAdvantage. I've also included my contact information in case you do have any additional questions. And you can reach out to me directly or reach out to your HR consultant or the HR service center, the HR team. In this presentation, we will discuss the Fair Labor Standards Act or the FLSA. We'll go into more information regarding independent contractor versus an employee and the differences between them. We'll also discuss the IRS's three characteristics in regards to an IC and an employee. The different required forms depending on whether the worker is an ind independent contractor or an employee, and then the different consequences of misclassification. First, we'll discuss housekeeping and just general usage in the webinar. On the right-hand side of your screen, you will see the toolbar, and you can ask questions in that section as well, and we'll follow up regarding your questions towards the end of the webinar. You can also select the blue icon in case you want to view the webinar on your full screen or in window mode. And then the bottom icon you can use to show or hide your control panel. So let's go into more detail regarding the FLSA and the general level. The law itself was established in 1938 by the Department of Labor, specifically the Wage and Hour Division. A summary of the FLSA, it establishes the minimum wage on the federal level, of course, and there might be some state minimum wage laws as well. And in those cases specifically where an employee is subject to both state and federal minimum wage laws, the employee would be entitled to the higher minimum wage, of course. It also established overtime pay, um, which covers non-exempt employees. Um, who must receive overtime pay for any hours worked over 40 per work week. It established um, regulations in regards to child labor standards, and these provisions were designed to protect the educational opportunities of minors and also prohibit their employment and jobs and under conditions that were detrimental or potentially dangerous to their health or well-being. And then it mandated equal pay, and it also set record-keeping rules for private sector and government workers. And those record-keeping rules were in regard to poster requirements, so posting information about the FLSA, as well as timekeeping and pay records. The different types of covers that are established under the FLSA include both enterprise as well as individual type coverage. Under enterprise, um, so if an enterprise is covered, all employees of the enterprise would be entitled to FLSA protection. In regards to individual coverage, even if the enterprise may not be covered, the individual employees might still be covered and entitled to FLSA protection. So we're going to go a little bit more in detail in regards to enterprise coverage. So those enterprises are companies with at least two employees and at least 500,000 a year in business are covered. And then it also accounts for hospitals and businesses that provide medical or nursing care for residents, schools, preschools, and federal, state, and local government agencies. On the individual coverage level, it accounts for those workers who might be engaged in interstate commerce, the production of goods for commerce, any closely related process or occupation that's related um, directly essential to such production or domestic service. And to clarify what interstate commerce includes, um, it could include making telephone calls to other states, typing letters to send to other states, processing credit card transactions, or traveling to other states. So obviously you can see that includes a lot of employees, um, and a lot of employees are covered under the FLSA except for those that are considered to be exceptions. Now that we've discussed what is covered on the general level under the FLSA and the types of coverage, we can go into more detail regarding what the FLSA does not require or account for. And that includes meal or rest periods, vacation and holiday severance or sick pay, premium pay for weekend or holiday work, 
a discharge notice, reason for discharge, or immediate payment of final wages to separated employees, any limit on the number of hours in a day or days in a week that an employee that's at least 16 years old maybe requires scheduled to work, pay raises, or fringe benefits. And obviously it's very important to note in the section as well that there might be state laws that do provide for these items or that might require different provisions. So this is more on the federal general level, but you need to be aware of state specifications as well. And then as a reminder, so where there are federal and state laws that do have different provisions, the higher or more generous standard would apply. In case you do need some additional information or you do have some additional questions about how to comply with the FLSA, you can feel free to reach out to CoAdvantage directly or you can follow up with the Department of Labor. They do provide some generous and helpful compliance assistance materials, including information regarding the law and regulations themselves, interpretive guidance of the law and regulations, the poster, a handy reference guide, fact sheets, um, information for new businesses, and of course just general information on the Department of Labor homepage. As I did mention, the FLSA is enforced by the Department of Labor and specifically is carried out by the Wage and Hour Division of the DOL. Where there are potential violations that have been found, the Wage and Hour Division would advise employers of the steps that need to be taken to correct those violations and then secure agreement to comply in the future as well as supervising voluntary payment of back wages as it applies. It's important to know within that um, that there is a two-year statute of limitations that generally does apply to recovery of back pay. However, when there is a case of a willful violation, a three-year statute of limitations might apply. In case there hasn't been a voluntary agreement that has been reached in order to, to pay any back wages that might be due to the employee or worker, the wage and hour division might actually bring suit to obtain an injunction to restrain the employer from violating the FLSA, which could include the withholding of proper minimum wage and overtime. Or uh, they could bring suit for back wages and an equal amount as liquidated damages. Or also the employee, him or herself, could file a private suit as well in regards to back pay. Some of the penalties that are um, listed per the Department of Labor do include um, that the employers who willfully violate the act might be prosecuted criminally and fined an amount up to $11,000. Employers who do violate the youth employment provisions are subject to a civil money penalty of up to $11,000 for each employee who was the subject of a violation. And then those employers who willfully or repeatedly violate the minimum wage or overtime pay requirements are subject to a civil money penalty of up to $1,100 for each such violation. So it's very important to know that the different penalties and fines that are and have been seen by the DOL because FLSA lawsuits are on the rise and have become more frequent. In additional information, there is a wage and hour specific website that goes into more information. You can also call their toll-free number and helpline if you have any questions. The Department of Labor also has a very helpful interactive advisor system. Um, it's just Department of Labor, DOL.gov, ELAWS, which has more information. Or you can also call or visit your local wage and hour division office. And then going into more information regarding what the FLSA considers an employee. As we have highlighted earlier, the FLSA establishes minimum wage, overtime pay, record keeping, child labor standard guidelines, and it applies to employees or workers. So in, in order for the FLSA to apply, there must be an employment relationship between the employer and the employee. And the FLSA's definition of employee includes to suffer or permit to work. And this definition obviously was specifically designed to broadly cover as many workers as possible. 
And in applying the FLSA's definition, workers who are economically dependent on the business of the employer, regardless of their skill level, are considered to be employees, and most workers are considered to be employees thus. Um, on the other hand, independent contractors could be considered to be workers with economic independence and who are in business for themselves, essentially. When an employer or employee relationship does exist, and the employee is engaged in work that is subject to the FLSA, the employee must be paid at least the federal or state minimum wage, and in most cases, over time, at time and one half, his or her regular rate of pay for all hours worked in excess of 40 per week. And that's another area with overtime as well. You might want to check your state regulations in case there's any differences there. In regards to the FLSA and independent contractors, the FLSA's minimum wage and overtime requirements do not apply to independent contractors. Um, and that's a common error to avoid, is just treating an employee as an independent contractor when they are not, and we'll cover more of differences and consequences of misclassification in this webinar. The next section is covering the differences between an independent contractor, or IC, versus an employee. So how do we determine whether a worker is truly an employee or an independent contractor? Um, we should basically consider what is the economic reality of the worker's relationship with the employer, which determines potentially whether the worker is economically dependent on the employer and thus an employee or if the worker is in business for him or herself, and therefore potentially an independent contractor. And the courts do generally apply a number of economic reality factors as guides when making a determination, but the factors applied can vary, and it's important to remember that no one set of factors is exclusive. Next, we'll cover some significant factors to consider when you're making a determination between an independent contractor or employee status. Um, the first one is the extent to which the worker's services are an integral part of the employer's business. So does the worker play an integral role in the business by performing a primary type of work that the employer performs for his or her customers or clients? Um, is that person an essential employee of the job? Also to consider is the permanency of the relationship or the duration of the employment. So how long has the worker worked for the same company? Is it more project-based, long-term? Another factor would be the amount of the worker's investment in facilities and equipment. So is the worker reimbursed for any purchases or materials, supplies, etc., or does the worker use his or her own tools or equipment for the job? Next one is the nature and degree of control by the company. Um, so who decides on what hours are to be worked? Who is responsible for quality control? Does the worker work for any other companies while being employed by the company? And who sets the pay rate for the worker? The worker's opportunities for profit and loss. Did the worker make any investments such as insurance or bonding? Can the worker earn a profit by performing the job more efficiently or exercising managerial skill or potentially suffer a loss of capital investment? The next bullet point, the worker's skill and initiative. So does the worker perform routine tasks that require little training or does the worker advertise independently? Um, does the worker have a separate business website, for example? specialized knowledge, training, or experience, and then also whether or not they exercise independent judgment. So as a reminder, no single economic realities factor determines whether a worker is an employee or an independent contractor. And one thing to keep in mind over the next few months and year as well is that the courts may consider additional factors that shed light on whether a worker is an employee or independent contractor. Um, the factors should not be implied essentially as a checklist, so you shouldn't be going through and checking each of these bullet points. Uh, but what does matter is whether the totality of the circumstances indicate that the worker is an employee or independent contractor. So next we're going to kind of discover and discuss these economic reality factors based on the Department of Labor information in more detail. And the first one, as we mentioned, was that the work is integral to the business. 
Um, so work is integral to the employer's business if it is a part of the production process or it's a service that the employee is in business to provide. Um, if the work is performed is integral to the employer's business or the work is essential to the business and the worker is more likely economically dependent on the employer. The next one to consider is the managerial skill for profit or loss, as we mentioned. And this factor should focus on the worker's managerial skill and whether the skill would affect the worker's profit and loss. And the issue is not whether the worker possesses the skills, but whether the skills are managerial at that level and suggests that the worker is operating as an independent business. Managerial skills that suggest Independent contractor status also include the ability to make independent business decisions, um, such as those that decide um, business investments or potentially hire helpers as needed. Trying to work more jobs or longer hours would not be considered such a business decision, but when you do analyze this factor, it's also important to consider whether the worker faces a possible loss as a result of these independent business decisions. For relative investment, the worker must make some type of investment and undertake some risk for a loss to indicate that he or she is in an independent business. Um, solely purchasing tools to perform a particular job is not sufficient investment to indicate in an independent business. And the worker's investment must also compare favorably with the employer's investment to suggest the worker is an independent contractor. A worker's investment compares favorably when investment is substantial as well as the investment is used for the purpose of sustaining a business beyond the job or project the work is performing. So that's one thing to keep in mind is the project or whatever work is required, um, if it continues from there with the employer or elsewhere, or if the tools will be required elsewhere as well. For skill and initiative, um, both employees and independent contra contractors may obviously be skilled and even highly skilled specialized workers. Um, those that have skills such as computer programming does not necessarily obviously indicate that it's an independent contractor status, however. But to suggest that the worker is an independent contractor, the skills should demonstrate that the worker exercises independent business judgment or initiative. In regards to the duration of the relationship, either a permanent or long-term or indefinite relationship with the employer could suggest the worker is an employee. However, the absence of a permanent long-term or indefinite relationship does not automatically indicate that the worker is an independent contractor. So what really matters is whether the impermanence is a result of the worker's own choice, which could suggest an independent contractor status or the structure of that particular industry or employer, which could indicate that the worker is an employee. In regards to control, um, the, an independent contractor could typically work relatively free from control from an employer or anyone else for that matter, including the employer's clients. Um, this factor includes those who control the hiring and firing, so who had the power to hire and fire, who maintained the employee's records, uh, the amount of pay, so who determined the rate and the method of payment, the hours of work, so you can ask yourself, so who supervises and controls employees' work schedules, the conditions of employment, and of course, how the work is performed, performance expectations in regards to the work performed. The employer's lack of control does not automatically indicate that the worker is an independent contractor. The employer can still obviously exercise control over a worker who is working remotely, off-site, or teleworking. And to be considered an independent business, the worker must also exercise control over meaningful aspects of the work. And there is a lot of information that's provided by the Department of Labor guidance, and then other government websites can also assist with determination and providing more information in regards to the determination. And one of them that I found that I really liked was from the Texas Workforce Commission, 
and they have what they call an independent contractor test. Um, so I've included some of the bullet points here, and we'll go into more information regarding them as well to provide you additional guidance. The first, first one is instructions. So an employee would potentially receive instructions about when, where, and how the work is to be performed, where the IC does the job his or her own way with few, if any, instructions as to the detail or method of the work. In regard to training, employees are often trained by a more experienced employee or are required to attend meetings tra training courses, whereas an IC uses his or her own methods and thus does not need receive training from the purchaser of those services. Integration, services of an employee are usually merged into the firm's overall operation and the company's success depends on those employee services. Whereas an IC, um, their services are usually separate from the client's business and are not integrated or merged into it. Services are rendered personally. An employee services must be rendered personally. They do not hire their own substitutes or delegate work to them. A true IC is able to assign another to do the job in his or her place and need not perform the services personally. The next bullet point, hiring, supervising, and paying helpers. An employee may act as a foreman for the employer, for example, but if so, the helpers are paid with the employer's funds. However, the IC can select, hire, pay, and supervise any helpers that are used and are responsible for the results of the helper's labor. Continuing relationship, an employee often continues to work for the same employer month after month, year after year, uh, depending on whether it's at will employment as well. An IC is usually hired to do one job of limited or indefinite duration and has no expectation of continuing work unless additional projects or work are required. Set hours of work, an employee may work on call or during hours and days as set by the employer and an IC is the master for the most part of his or her own time and can work the days and hours he or she requires and chooses as um, necessary for the project. And then full time um, might be required. It just really depends on the situation as well. And the location where the services are performed, whether it's more on site with employers location or client sites or whether the work could be done at an IC um, office or remotely in their home office as well. And then the order or sequence set as well. So the oral or written reports, an employee may be required to submit regular oral or written reports about the work as it's in progress whereas an IC is usually not required to submit regular oral reports about the work in progress unless it's required. Payment by the hour, work, or a month. An employee is typically paid by the employer in regular amounts at stated intervals, such as by the hour, week, or bi-weekly, semi-monthly on pay periods. An IC would normally be paid by the job, either a negotiated flat rate or upon submission of a bid. The payment of business and travel expense. Um, so an employee's business and travel expenses are generally either paid directly or reimbursed by the employer. An IC normally pay all of their own business and travel expenses without reimbursement, and that's considered in the contract. Furnishing tools and equipment. Employees are furnished all necessary tools, materials, and equipment by the employer. However, an IC ordinarily provides all of the tools and equipment necessary to complete the job. In regards to significant investment, an employer generally has little or no investment in the business. An employee is economically dependent on the employer, but true ICs usually have a substantial financial investment in their own independent business. Realizing profit or loss, an employee does not ordinarily realize a profit or loss in the business. Rather, the employee would be paid for services rendered. And an IC can either realize a profit or suffer a loss depending on the management of their own expenses and revenues. Working for more than one firm at a time, an employee ordinarily works for one employer at a time and may be prohibited from joining a competitor, especially if there's a conflict of interest. An IC often works for more than one client or firm at the same time 
and is not subject to a non-competition rule. Making service available to the public. Um, an employee does not make his or her own services available to the public except through the employer's company, whereas an IC may advertise, carry business cards, or hold a separate business license. Right to discharge without liability. An employee can be discharged at any time without liability on the employer's part, and depending on the circumstances, of course, there. Um, if the work does meet the contract terms for an IC, um, they would not be fired without liability for breach of contract. And the right to quit without liability. An employer may quit work at any time without liability on the employee's part. Um, and an IC is legally responsible for job completion and on quitting could become liable for breach of contract. And for additional information for this section as well, you can visit the, the Wage and Hour Division website, as I mentioned. Their helpline is here for your information again. And then if you do have any questions about 1099s or independent contractors, and the tax status of employees versus independent contractors, you can also visit the IRS website for more information specifically in that regard. And next, we'll kind of go into more information about what the IRS considers three characteristics to consider when making a determination about whether an employee or worker is an employee or independent contractor. So the first one that they consider is behavioral control. So that covers the facts that show whether the business has the right to direct or control how the work is done through instructions, training, or other means. So if you do receive extensive instructions on how the work is to be done, this could suggest that you are an employee. However, if you receive less extensive instructions about what should be done, but not how it should be done, you might be an independent contractor. So for instance, instructions about time and place may be less important than directions on how the work is performed. And if the business does provide you with training about required procedures and methods, this indicates that the business wants the work done in a certain specific way, and this suggests that you might be an employee. But if the instructions um, can cover a wide range of topics, um, for example, so it could cover how, when, or where to do the work, what tools or equipment to use, uh, what assistance to hire to help with the work, and where to purchase any necessary supplies and services. The next one is financial control. And that covers facts that show whether the business has the right to direct or control the financial and business aspects of the worker's job. First bullet point, significant investment. So if you have a significant investment in your work, you may be an independent contractor. And while there is no, for example, a precise dollar test, the investment must have substance. However, significant investment is not necessary to be an independent contractor. So for example, if you already have tools and equipment available to you and you don't need additional ones to purchase for this project. And going into that, next is expenses. So if you are not reimbursed for some or all business expenses, then you might be an independent contractor, especially if you're reimbursed business expenses that are high. Um, the opportunity for profit or loss, if you can realize profit or incur a loss, as we've mentioned, this suggests that you are in business for yourself and you might be an independent contractor. So if you have the right to control or direct not only what is done, but also how it is to be done, then your workers are most likely to be considered to be employees. And if you can direct or control only the result of the work that is done or completed and not the means and methods of accomplishing the result then your workers could be considered to be independent contractors. Number three, the type of relationship. Um, this factor relates to how the workers and the business owners perceive the relationship. So in regards to employee benefits, if you receive benefits such as insurance, pension, paid leave, this could be an indication that you, be, you might be an employee. And if you don't receive benefits, however, you could be either an employee or an independent contractor, depending on the situation. For written contracts, those might show um, what both you and the company intend, of course. Um, this may be very significant if it is difficult, if not impossible, to determine status based on other facts and determination factors. So some general guidance from the IRS. 
Um, it's very important to note that both employers and workers can actually follow up with the IRS themselves um, to make a determination on whether a specific individual is an independent contractor or an employee. They can do this by filing Form SS-8, Determination of Worker Status for Purposes of Federal Employment Taxes and Income Tax Withholding, and filing it specifically with the IRS. So that's one thing that's very important to know is the IRS has additional information, and you can follow up with them accordingly as you need to. For the independent contractor, kind of a checklist or guidelines, essentially, um, you can review the IRS criteria and other factors we've mentioned so far in this webinar. You can develop a written agreement with an assigned specific scope of work for a specific duration. Um, generally, an IC would not complete an employee application because they're not an employee. Um, you can require the contractor to supply his or her own workers' compensation insurance. They could supply their own equipment and tools if work is off-premise. Um, they can require payment to be rendered upon completion of a certain task or job. And then um, you would not pay for the contractor expenses. So businesses generally pay their own expenses, and expenses should be built into the contract for the cost of the entire job. And you generally would not provide continuing education training, but just training specific to your company or the task itself. Um, you do not have contractors perform similar work of employees or perform routine work that generally employees complete. The contractor work should not be close to the core business operations and therefore considered employee type or related work. And I would definitely require documentation that demonstrates an independent contractor relationship. And that could be either a copy of a business professional license, copy of the insurance certificate, copies of the independent contractor's advertising, or the business card, stationery, things of that nature, just to confirm that relationship. Next, we're going to go ahead and test your knowledge and see um, if you recall what we recently mentioned in regards to the IRS guidelines. They consider that the three characteristics that should be considered to determine the relationship between businesses and workers to be including behavioral control, financial control, and what was the third characteristic. The answers are A, skill and initiative, B, managerial skill for profit or loss, C, the type of relationship, and D, relative investment. And we'll provide you with a few minutes to answer this question. Okay, and Meg, would you mind reading those um, responses? Uh, sure. Hey guys, um, it looks like 55% answered type of relationship, uh, and 18% each answered skill and initiative and managerial skill for profit and loss, and then 9% for relative investment. Okay. And the answer is actually C in regards to type of relationship. So that was what the IRS considers, and that's important to remember because also it has the tax implications as well and considerations for that. Um, so there obviously is a lot of information here that we provided to help you in making this determination. Next, we're going to go into the required forms um, for the employee. Um, obviously, the employer must withhold income tax, an employee's portion of Social Security and Medicare. 
an employer is responsible for paying Social Security, Medicare, and FIDA taxes on employees' wages. An employer would be responsible for his or her own portion of those as well. Um, the employer would provide the employee with a W-2 form, uh, the wage and tax statement, which shows the amount of taxes withheld from the employer's pay. And then they would also be required to complete the W-4, the federal tax form, and any applicable state tax forms. And upon employment, they would also complete Form I-9. And this one's just to see if you know offhand um, whether or not Form I-9 is required to be completed for an independent contractor. So answer is A for yes or B for no. All right, we have 71% no and 29% yes. Okay, and that sounds pretty good. It's, this is one area that's a little bit gray if you aren't familiar with IC, so I definitely understand why there's a little bit of variation. However, per the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, they do indicate that it is not required um, since an IC is not considered to be an employee, so they don't need to complete the Form I-9. Um, however, it's important to note um, that you need, do need to verify, of course, that they are authorized to work in the U.S. as well. So for the IC forms that do need to be completed, um, the business itself might be required to give the independent contractor Form 1099, miscellaneous income, to report what is paid um, to the independent contractor. And then the IC is responsible for paying his or her own income tax and self-employment tax. Uh, the business does not withhold taxes from the independent contractor's pay. But the IC may need to make estimated tax payments during the year to cover his or her own tax liabilities. The IC may deduct business expenses on Schedule C of his or her income tax return. Um, and then they might need to complete Form W-9 which is the request for taxpayer identification number and certification. And then as we've mentioned, they do not need to complete Form I-9. For those of you that might be interested in international independent contractors, it is very important to review every country's requirement in regards to the following. The income tax reporting. So while a few other countries have reporting requirements like the U.S., um, so this is a 1099 form. Um, these requirements do need to be reviewed for every location. Even where no such reporting requirement might exist, many companies or many countries charge an income tax or even a service fee to be withheld by the employer and paid to the country in which the work is performed. For the establishment of a local presence by the employer, some countries will not allow contractors to work for employers that don't have a local presence in that country. Um, if there's requirements not followed, employers will have engaged employees, not contractors, and they may have set up business without proper filings and permits that are required. It's a registration as a sole proprietor. Some countries do require self-employed individuals to register as a sole proprietor. While this burden is normally placed, obviously, on the contractor, practices should be put in place to be aware of these requirements and require proof of registration from the contractor. And then lastly, the contractor versus employee requirements. So as in the U.S., most countries do have requirements related to self-employed independent contractors. And while these requirements might vary from country to country, some general criteria include the following. So who has control over how the work is performed? Does the contractor have other clients and assume a risk of proper loss? Is the contractor paid for the project or for hours of work? Are benefits provided, such as vacation and sick leave? Do contractors make their own schedule and supply their own work location and supplies or equipment? 
And these criteria generally do not differ a lot from U.S. independent contractor laws, but the variances by country do need to be examined closely for compliance. So in general, in this regard, it would be very important to consult your lawyer, either an immigration lawyer or the applicable government departments for more specific information in regards to that country. Next, we're going to cover some of the consequences of misclassification of a worker. And then this is our last poll. So according to recent studies, approximately how many employers may misclassify their employees as independent contractors. So essentially, they classify them as an IC when they should be an employee. The answer is A is 0 to 10%. B, 10 to 30 percent, C, 30 to 50 percent, and lastly, D, 50 to 70 percent. For this one, 56% uh, of you said 10 to 30%, and 39% said 30 to 50%. Okay, so it seems like we're a little in the middle on both of those. And studies do suggest that B, 10 to 30% of employers may misclassify their employees as independent contractors. And that's a very important because that's a considerable amount of employers, if you imagine that, and a lot of penalties and other issues that would arise from that number as well. So a common problem does arise when employers do misclassify their workers who are employees under the law as independent contractors. And we'll discuss this in more detail on the following slides. So some of the consequences of misclassification, obviously there are tax consequences as we've discussed with the IRS as well. Um, employers are required to withhold income taxes on the basis of information that the employees provide on IRS Form W-4 or any state tax, state tax forms to their specific state governments. If an employer fails to withhold those income taxes on behalf of a worker improperly classified as an IC and the individual has failed to pay the taxes, the um, employer may be liable for federal and state taxes that were required to be withheld but were not. In addition, independent contractors are not eligible to receive tax-free benefits from the company. So if the company chooses to offer health care benefits to an IC, the contractor must pay income taxes on the value of the benefit. If the company includes an independent contractor in its defined benefit pension plan, it could also risk losing the tax-exempt status of that plan. Another consequence is employee benefit obligations. Um, there's been a recent illustrative case of Viscaino versus Microsoft Corporation in which the court found that Microsoft had mischaracterized certain workers as independent contractors and freelancers. Although the workers had been hired for specific projects, some continued to work on successive projects for a number of years. And they were fully integrated, essentially, into Microsoft's workforce and worked on site, on work teams, along with Microsoft's regular employees. They also even shared some of the same supervisors, performed identical functions, and worked the same core hours as regular employees. Microsoft even went as far as to provide them with admittance card keys, office equipment, supplies. However, as independent contractors, these workers were not eligible for the same employee benefits that Microsoft's regular employees received. Microsoft eventually reached a settlement for $96.885 million and was subsequently assessed approximately $27.128 million in attorney fees and costs, which is quite substantial. There are also another consequence is the, in regards to the Affordable Care Act employer mandates. 
the determination by the IRS of misclassified workers under the ACA could lead to companies suddenly being retroactively deemed as a large employer, subject to the mandate and all applicable penalties. In regards to workers' compensation, a misclassified worker could result in the supposed employer being held liable for on-the-job injuries outside the protection of the workers' compensation system and for penalties as well associated with that. In regards to unemployment and compensation, a worker may file a claim for unemployment compensation and be granted benefits if the unemployment agency believes that the worker was misclassified as an independent contractor. If the organization misclassified the worker, it could be held liable for penalties and interest in addition to unpaid unemployment insurance premiums. Consequence for wage and hour liability, the widespread use of independent contractors does invite, obviously, the scrutiny of plaintiff attorneys, attorneys who may be eager to bring a class or even a collective action suit for unpaid overtime or minimum wage violations under the FLSA or state wage and hour laws. For example, in December of 2005, a judgment was entered against FedEx Ground awarding $5.3 million in damages and $12.3 million um, in attorney fees as a result of a misclassification of employees as independent contractors. And then lastly, in regards to vicarious liability, an employer may incur liability for wrongful acts of a worker that is mistakenly, mistakenly classified as an independent contractor. These are all areas that you want to be really concerned with and be aware of as well. Some additional consequences. The workers classified as independent contractors may be wrongfully denied access to important benefits and protections, including minimum wage and overtime, as we mentioned, workers' compensation, as we mentioned, as well as family and medical leave, potentially. Misclassified employees may still be eligible for unemployment insurance, but misclassification does complicate their ability to collect those benefits. And some examples of the Department of Labor enforcement and misclassification penalties include, in 2015, a Texas employer paid more than $108,000 2014, an Arizona employer paid $600,000. 2013, the Department of Labor recovered more than $1 million from a Kentucky employer. 2013, a federal judge ordered a Pennsylvania employer to pay $1.3 million. And in 2012, a Minnesota employer paid $500,000. So as you can see, these are not small amounts. These are substantial penalties, and there have been more recent cases of these higher penalty levels as well. So we definitely need to be aware of that and make sure we're classifying workers correctly. So where do you go from here? Obviously, if you do have additional questions, you can reach out to the websites and departments I mentioned. You can call your HR consultant or the HR Service Center. The HR Service Center's email is hrteam at coadvantage.com. And the phone number is listed below as well. We will have additional webinars and more information from blogs and tools to provide to you for additional assistance. You can also stay up to date. We do have a CoAdvantage blog that's listed online. It's coadvantage.com slash blog, which has a lot of relevant, important information um, that's uploaded there periodically as well for your reference. And next, we're going to go ahead into the question and answer section of the webinar. So if you do have any additional questions, feel free to let us know. And we'll follow up accordingly um, in the next, looks like we have about 12 minutes left in your time. And then also, if you do have any additional questions after this webinar has been completed, please feel free to reach out to us directly, either your HR consultant, myself, the HR team, the service center, um, if you do have additional questions or information necessary. And this is how you do type in the questions, as we mentioned in the beginning. So you can just use the question section in the toolbar. And you just type your question in the below section and click send. It'll be sent over to us directly.
So we do have a question in regards to the independent contractor not having to fill out an I-9. So um, it would still be very imperative for the employer to verify that the IC can work in the U.S. Although they don't have to complete the actual I-9 form, um, you do need to verify that they can work in the U.S. Otherwise, you would need to follow up with your immigration lawyer or the applicable um, country government for more information. Make sure you're following by that country's guidelines as well and the laws there. And there's another question in regards to project-based but independent contractors that are paid by the hours um, and that they sign a contract indicating duration of the project, the hourly rate that they have agreed to. Generally, you, you would be able to provide them with the hourly pay. You just have to be, make sure it's project-based in regards to certain tasks and responsibilities. Um, so it just really depends on the situation. Um, but it just needs to make sure that it's different from how the employees are paid or the work that they're working on. And there's a question in regards to the document that the independent contractor provides, and I'm assuming that's in regards to verifying that they can work in the U.S. You wouldn't be required to provide um, to make a copy of that document, but it might be beneficial just to make a copy of it and to keep it in records well along with any other contracts or any other documents that you have there, just so you can validate and, and verify that if it's needed going forward, but it's not directly required. Um, such as an I-9, it really depends on the policy of whether you keep all of the picture documents with I-9. If you do it for one employee, you should do it for all. So it's similar to that. Okay. Are there any other additional questions that are coming through? Okay, and if you do have any other additional questions or questions that might not have been addressed specifically by this webinar, please feel free to reach out to us directly. Um, we are here to assist you and to help with any other additional questions that you might have. We hope you have a good day.